so uh, a bit about me so uh, my name is rahul uh, i go by the handle missing factor uh, on internet i work for thoughtworks for past 5 years i've been dabbling into multiple programming languages uh, scala which i worked with professionally for 3 years then uh, i also dabbled into haskell closure and even some uh, obscure ones uh, like factor so uh, before uh, i move ahead uh, i would like to survey my audience and uh, see what is the distribution of various communities that we have today so how many of you have uh, programmed in functional languages before please raise your hands okay uh, how many of you believe that uh, functional paradigm is clearly superior to object oriented paradigm okay uh, and how many of you believe that it's the other way around all right only one guy and uh, how many of you believe that multi paradigm languages is the way to go okay uh, so i guess we have a good distribution of all kind of people so this should be a lot of fun so this is the situation today and uh, we see these kind of statements floating around all the time some people will claim uh, fp is superior to object oriented object orientation some people claim that o is the natural way of thinking some will claim o is a passe and so on right we hear this kind of statements all the time and this is our regular programmer who is completely confused what to believe and uh, which of this is true right something has to be true so uh, if you are hoping that by the end of this talk uh, i'm going to answer the question uh, which one is better or whether the uh, combination is better uh, i have to disappoint you i will not be answering that question for you my go my goal rather is to leave you with even more questions and with more meaningful questions and yes so uh, in this talk i'm going to try and tear apart the notions you may have about paradigms uh, functional programming and object oriented programming essentially my goal uh, is to piece off everyone o people fp people so yeah let the feather ruffling begin so this word paradigm is very popular uh, with programmers for some reason and this is the dictionary definition of uh, paradigm it says uh, a framework containing basic assumptions ways of thinking and methodology accepted by a community right essentially defines a school of thought and as should be evident from the definition this term is a uh, very vague right it's a very vague attempt at categorization of a, a school of thought so uh, this term even though it is uh, useful in certain context uh, i am going to argue it's not very useful in the context of software the reason being uh, the reason being that the paradigm the term itself uh, has a uh, has a vagueness to it so if you use the term uh, while keeping in mind the inherent vagueness to the term it's all fine but if we look at the software landscape today uh, what you will notice is that um, paradigms are treated as though there is a clear boundary between them this technique is a fp technique this is the o technique right partial application belongs to fp uh, subtyping belongs to o and so on so these uh, so called paradigms are not really uh, disjoint schools of thought and that's the point i'm going to drive through this talk what what i have uh, seen is that uh, the whole notion of paradigm leads to unnecessary uh, rivalry among these uh, camps so according to me the term paradigm uh, when used in the context of uh, software uh, engineering hurts more than it helps and uh, lately uh, and i'm not the only one with the, this thought uh, lately many uh, respected programming language researchers uh, are shifting to an opinion uh, their opinion is shifting to a thought that paradigms uh, should be abandoned okay so here is a uh, excerpt from an abstract that uh, mr shriyam krishna murthy a very well known programming language researcher submitted for uh, some course what he says is that programming language pr paradigms are a moribund and tedious legacy of a bygone age modern language designers pay them no respect so why do we slavishly adhere to them here is mr uh, slava besto creator of uh, factor programming language uh, i have picked this statement from his one of his blog posts 
which says labels like o and functional have so many conflicting interpretations that they are almost totally devoid of meaning so in that blog post he uh, goes on to further claim that uh, unless any new programming language unless it's a, a complete copy of some predecessor it cannot be uh, judiciously categorized into any of the existing paradigm uh, even this fake philosopher mr plt allen de botton uh, does not like the word paradigm what he says is that uh, pl paradigms do not really exist only features techniques and idioms grouped in different ways throw off your paradigm and be free so uh, that's what they really are features techniques and idioms roughly grouped into certain buckets uh, no, nothing more than that if you treat them as anything more than that uh, it's going to be harmful and according to me paradigms are a computer science equivalent of tribalism the reason being the differences that you see among these paradigms are typically uh, more cultural or socio political uh, than technical really so that's a very big statement i'm and uh, i'm going to run you through a series of examples to show you how uh, how this can be true so uh, you will uh, if you uh, take an overview of uh, functional uh, ideas or the ideas uh, labeled as functional and the ideas labeled as uh, object oriented uh, what you will notice is that uh, many of these ideas right they are complementary in some cases in some cases the ideas are common to uh, both camps and uh, and sometimes uh, sometimes there will be some impetus mismatch but those cases are uh, fewer than uh, you may think so there is a lot of room for cross pollination here the many ideas could be uh, brought from various different uh, so called camps brought together and that could uh, lead us to uh, better ab abstractions so that's an assertion i'm going to make if we forget paradigms and admit interesting and useful ideas it will lead us to better abstractions and better programming languages so uh, i'm going to uh, show you some examples for that and before uh, moving to that let's uh, talk about this a bit so what are today's uh, two most popular paradigms right object oriented and functional correct now uh, to uh, have any meaningful discussion about these two uh, we must define these terms but if you notice uh, all the object oriented programming languages you take all of them together and take a take a intersection of their feature sets and what you will notice is that you get a null set there is not a single feature common to all the object oriented programming languages you tell me one feature and i can tell you a language uh, which does not have that and calls itself object oriented therefore uh, i am defining uh, object oriented programming uh, in our context uh, to accommodate the more mainstream object oriented programming languages so this is uh, the first definition of objects objects serve as first class modules so this is the most minimal definition given by a well known researcher william cook so what he means is means by that uh, the term sounds very fancy but all it means is that when you create a class like say point and then you create a object of this class p equal to new point you can say p dot x right where x refers to one of its variables so uh, this object uh, acts as a namespace for its fields and its methods in which sense it's like a first class module and cook uh, cook claims that this is a sufficient definition however uh, there are some researchers who do not really agree with that so i included some more uh, the next feature which i think is essential to objects is self recursion again it sounds like a very fancy term uh, but all it means is the this reference this or self that we know from the uh, all the object oriented languages i, I presume uh, so in programming language theories this uh, this is represented by greek character mu so if there are any functional programmers here who thought that uh, they are the only ones with cool greek characters boo the next feature uh, which i think is essential to object orientation is subtyping so for the purpose of our talk uh, we can think of subtyping as uh, subclassing uh, even though that's not a that's not an accurate description uh, we can go with that and the next is uh, traits or classes these essentially serve as uh, templates for your objects again not really essential uh, to o, but uh, since they are part of pretty much every uh, object oriented language or the mainstream ones i have included those next let's try and define uh, functional programming to be honest i had even harder time defining this so uh, we'll see why so the uh, most uh, standard feature of uh, functional programming is first class functions right 
what do we mean by first class so the term uh, first class function was uh, i believe was first used by a guy called uh, christopher strachey and uh, it's very difficult to uh, define this term very precisely so we'll uh, run with the definition which fits in our context which is uh, the f function in your language has the highest rights okay they enjoy all the rights that the other regular values do so you should be able to pass a function to another function you should be able to return a function from a function you should be able to store a function in your data structure and so on and this gives rise to a uh, higher order functions which are essentially functions that uh, accept functions or return functions then a uh, function composition in which uh, you combine multiple functions in interesting ways to do something more interesting the next is uh, immutability so in functional languages there is a lot of emphasis on immutability now uh, i would claim that uh, uh, functional language uh, functional programming when done with dynamic typing and when done with static typing is so different uh, that for a canonical interpretation of paradigm it constitutes a new paradigm altogether which is why i have included another slide for this one so the features i mentioned for functional programming still hold but there are some new ones that uh, come to the table the key one is uh, algebraic data types we'll get to that later uh, the next one is uh, type classes now type classes are not really uh, present in all the typed functional languages but all of them have some equivalent of those so i have included them and lastly equational reasoning a way of reasoning very commonly employed in uh, typed functional languages now uh, my uh, original statement right it was that if we forget paradigms and bring ideas together from uh, various various uh, sources it could lead to better abstractions and a better programming language so as an example of that uh, i'm going to use scala programming language so here is a uh, uh, the reason i chose scala is because first uh, this is the language i'm most uh, comfortable with this is what i've used for past three years and secondly because i believe that this is the language uh, which realizes this goal uh, very well okay so uh, i came across scala uh, through this talk of odorsky which he delivered in back in 2006 at google at the time scala i don't think he was uh, planning to see scala being used by anyone so it was a research project and uh, what uh, the, the theme of this talk was unification okay so if you can see in his uh, slides there are two chairs and there is a man sitting in between what he said was it's a functional chair and there is an object oriented chair and i am a man who is sitting in between what he tried uh, through this language and uh, some other languages that he created before this was to unify various ideas uh, in a single whole a simpler whole so i came across this tweet uh, some time back which i think captures the spirit of scala very well if a grand unified theory of programming languages existed its implementation would be called scala however there also has been a quite quite a bit of criticism of scala so this guy this is a, this guy is a haskeller he says if you like programming languages and food he is the culinary equivalent of scala it's a vegetarian ham uh, with a chicken flavor so uh, jokes apart uh, what uh, odorsky wanted was to have a few constructs with which he could implement all these ideas all these interesting ideas from uh, who are labeled uh, under what put under the functional label and those put under the o label and these are the few uh, orthogonal features that he chose for this implementation by the way this is one way of going about it there are n number of ways and if the talk permits i will point you to some others so traits and classes for some reason uh, objects these are well known in the world and implicit this is something uh, new uh, and we'll get to that okay so let's start the showcase of some examples uh, when in scala tries to bring bunch of ideas together and how it makes them better okay so the first example that i have is a very simple one functions as objects so scala supports first class functions right it's a uh, functional language after all it has to support them but functions are still objects in scala how does it do that pretty simple uh, there are traits like function 1 function 2 function 3 up to n which are essentially interfaces right uh, with one single method called apply so what happens when you uh, write a lambda like that there is a function f i defined which takes two integers and adds them up this d sugars to this and those who are done java can easily recognize this as an anonymous in a class 
instantiation, when there is a method called apply, and whatever you write there goes in the body of apply, right? So the point I'm driving is that, uh, uh, sorry, one more. And at the type level, when you write a type like that, int comma int to int, this will dish over to this, where function two is nothing but an interface with three type parameters. So uh, the point I'm driving is this: is that uh, in Haskell, OCaml or F-sharp, functions are primitives, right? They are not composed of any other matter. They are the primitives. Scala takes another approach and uh, makes them objects. So there has to be some advantage to this approach, right? Uh, so the first advantage is that you can treat data structures as functions. So when you talk about sequence, right, you can think of sequence as a function which grows from, goes from integer to the element type. Okay? How so? What is the canonical operation for sequence? Indexing. I ask sequence what lies at your uh, third place, it gives me the element back. So you can view sequence as its canonical function, which is into a. Similarly set, uh, what, do, what is the canonical operation for set? Uh, containment test, right? Membership test. So you can uh, think of set as a function that goes from A to Boolean. Then map, uh, maybe the simplest of all, is a function from key to value, correct? By the way, uh, even closure does that. <coughs> the next advantage is uh, functions as objects. So you can have your own uh, data types, which can act like functions, okay? This is a small advantage, but uh, helps, really. So parser is nothing but something that takes an input and gives you a parse result back, correct? Similarly, uh, there is a label function, which is a very simple interface. It just extends the function interface and ad adds one more abstract method to it. Uh, this helps when you are doing a lot of uh, uh, expression passing. Uh, those are something called variance annotations. We can ignore them for the purpose of this talk. Okay, so uh, so here, in just because functions were exposed as regular O interfaces, you are able to do these all of these things, which uh, are not easily possible in uh, other functional languages. The next example that I have is that of uh, records and classes. So uh, most type functional languages, uh, in fact, all functional languages will give you some sort of uh, record mechanism. So for those of you who are not familiar with records, you can think of them like C structs, essentially uh, data types without methods. Now when you define a record type in any functional language, uh, you get a bunch of things for free, right? When you define a data type, what you get is a structural equality checking, right? Those fields are immutable. You get field accessors. Uh, sometimes you can get string representations. Then you can use those data types in pattern matching. Correct? There's a lot that you get for free when you define a record type. So in Scala, uh, what what we have is case classes. So case classes are equivalent to the immutable records in other functional languages. But as the name suggests, case classes are still uh, classes. So what Scala does when you define a case class is uh, it generates all these methods for you. Equals, hash code, to string, copy, apply, unapply, etc. And uh, I'm going to focus on uh, two of these copy and uh, unapply in particular, and show you some differences <laughs> with the records, okay? So here is a record update in Haskell. What I've done here, I defined a data type called A, which has two fields, A and B. I created a value of type A, A1, equal to A12. Now I want to change the value of field A to something else, some string. And this is the syntax that Haskell provides me for that. Open brace. Whatever field you want to change, close brace, OK? Uh, what I want you to notice here is that record update is a special syntax in Haskell, a language level syntax. And that's the case with uh, most, most implementations, I guess. OCaml and F-sharp do the same thing. Now, uh, this syntax is not used anywhere. And uh, a good programming language will not have a syntax for something as specific as this, is what I believe. And this is what uh, Scala does in this case. So when you define a case class, compiler will generate this copy method for you. The implementation is pretty straightforward. <laughs> All the arguments that appear in constructor also mirror in the argument list of copy, correct? And the in, uh, their default values are the values that the object already holds. So here I create a value of type A called A1. And when I want to change the uh, value of that field A, I just say A1.copy, A equal to some string. 
so uh, what you should notice here is that copy is just a regular method okay and it's using uh, default arguments and named arguments to enable this kind of syntax now uh, default arguments and named arguments are can be used anywhere else they were not meant for this uh, use case in particular but they easily solve this use case and you do not have to put a special syntax in your language just for updating records okay so this shows how uh, copy uh, how copy uh, can employ the existing features the copying mechanism to implement something uh, which requires syntax in other languages so uh, i mentioned the one other method called unapply we'll come back to it later next uh, algebraic data types so again uh, this these are these comprise of some types for types exponents and more here i have a very simple uh, algebraic data type definition called option so data option a equal to some a none that's an or so when you define this data type again uh, you get a bunch of things for free so when you uh, use a value of option a in a pattern match compiler knows what are the possible cases correct so it can perform something called exhaustiveness checking so it can tell you whether all the cases have been matched whether there are any redundant cases missing cases and things like that and secondly uh, of course you can use these in pattern matches correct that's the only way of uh, only way to participate in the haskell pattern matching now again uh, scala will always try to avoid this sort of magic and uh, open up whatever mechanism it is using to you as a programmer so let's see how scala does this so this is the equivalent definition in scala so uh, scala will employ the existing class hierarchy to implement this concept of uh, algebraic data types one word you add here is called sealed right there is a sealed word there without that it's a regular uh, inheritance correct with sealed what you get is that uh, the type system knows that all the extensions of this type option are in this compilation unit you cannot extend this data type outside this compilation unit uh, why is this beneficial this uh, allows compiler to know uh, what are the possible cases all the possible cases and the exhaustiveness checking that you had in haskell can be enabled here as well so if you use a data type uh, a value of type option in pattern matching scala can actually perform exhaustiveness checking and tell you all the redundant or missing cases okay and the next part is pattern matching so as i mentioned before uh, pattern matching is not really uh, magic in scala or rather i would say it's a magic but it's it's a magic which is available to you as well so when you define a case class scala generates a method called unapply what does it do it takes a value of that type and deconstructs it into the into its components okay so in this case foo is deconstructed into in comment the reason i have option here uh, is you want to also indicate whether the matching happened or not so some means matching happened none means matching did not happen okay so this is what scala does for you and as we'll see since this contract of unapply is open to you you are free to define your own unapply you do not have to always define algebraic data types to go through to benefit from pattern matching now uh, again uh, what are the benefits of uh, implementing this as a regular class hierarchy over having uh, algebraic data type as a concept on its own in the language so here is the first uh, advantage uh, according to me at least <coughs> so in haskell when you define uh, an entity by entity i mean uh, algebraic data type not abstract data types uh, i have defined one uh, algebraic data type here color choice which has two cases custom color or default now forget that first line when i use that uh, custom data constructor this is how it looks background color equal to custom red but what does custom mean right so my namespace has been uh, polluted with this word called custom there is no way for me to know uh, what custom really denotes unless i look at the type correct in scala this is a very uh, easy to solve problem what you will do is uh, you will have a companion object of that uh, trait super trait and put your data constructors uh, i mean case class and case objects into your companion object and this is how the usage looks like color choice dot custom color dot red correct so the first class module aspect of objects helps here they they provide you very convenient name spaces and you could use them like that okay so uh, you have this in java as well right whenever you de define an enum in java uh, the the cases various cases are housed within the enum so you will never confused color dot red with signal dot red The next one which we actually use uh, is uh, extracting common behavior in mixins. 
So algebraic data types, right? Even though they are algebraic data types, they are still a class hierarchy. And all the abstractions which are available to uh, your, uh, regu uh, your regular classes are available to your algebraic data types as well. So let's say you have some common behavior in your entities which you want to extract out outside. Uh, you can do that. The example I have here is enum. Uh, forget the E manifest part. So what uh, this interface says is that you define the all method for me, and I give you the from string method, and you can provide uh, some more method like that. And I have another entity here called directive, which has two case objects, but uh, the component object here extends enum of directive and provides a method called all. Right. So I can say directive dot from string, and I can pass it a string, and it will load the appropriate object for me. Okay. So uh, the thing to note here is that something like that uh, cannot be done easily uh, in the languages uh, with algebraic where algebraic data types are an opaque, opaque structure. This this uh, implementation keeps them as, uh, as a uh, as a regular class hierarchy, and the various details are open to you. If you wanted, you could customize the pattern matching bit and uh, extract common behavior into mixings and many uh, kind of things. The next uh, example that I have is that of pattern matching. So as I mentioned before, pattern matching happens to be uh, magic in most languages. Uh, in Scala, it's not. And let's see how. So here's the contract. Uh, let's say you want to uh, match a value in a pattern matching block. Simple match. You don't want to do anything else. Just match the value. It will be a Boolean test, correct? Matches or not matches. So the contact will be A to Boolean. That's all. Now, uh, more advanced pattern matching use cases, we not only match the things, but we also extract values out of it, correct? Uh, those of you who were there for Moit's talk must have seen the list, list uh, deconstruction, right? X colon colon XS gives you head and tail apart, right? So for things like that, you must be able to extract out the value. So that's the contact you need to uh, fulfill. A to option B. The option part tells you whether the matching happened or not. And the B is the type uh, of the value that will be extracted. Uh, there is one more variation which uh, allows you to extract multiple values all at once. So option part here, again matched or not matched, sequence of B, the multiple values that were matched. By opening up this contract, uh, even your uh, non-algebraic uh, structures, like objects, regular objects, can benefit from pattern matching. You can preserve your encapsulation. You do not have to uh, show your private variables. And you can write your own un unapply, which exposes your uh, object in whatever way you want to, right? You can masquerade as whatever you want, which is an advantage. Uh, and this feature is called extractors. So why uh, why is it an advantage in object orientation, right? The common theme is that of uh, encapsulation. There are benefits to be uh, driven from not exposing the state. So you can have that as well, and uh, pattern matching too. Now regular expression is a class uh, which I have taken as an example. So the class regex in Scala uh, has the method called uh, unapply seek which allows me to do things like this. So what I've done here is uh, I've written one regular expression called module ID. And there are two capture patterns there. OK? And the unapply seek in regex class is defined in such a way that whatever the capture patterns are there will be emitted back. So you can match any string like that against these regular expressions. And we can extract the values there and do whatever you want with them. OK? Then uh, one more use case that we have, since the contract has been opened up to you, you could, you could virtually abstract over this in any way you want. So what I've done here is uh, there's a class called matcher, which takes a Boolean condition, a predicate function, and lifts it into an object which will, uh, whose unapply will call this function. Okay, As simple as that. So you can define pattern objects using this uh, simply like this. So this is how the implementation looks like. The matcher class takes the uh, condition as a parameter. And the unapply method will invoke that condition. So I define two patterns here. And then I say, I, I create a third pattern by composing these two patterns. I say even and positive. right? And is a combinator here, which will make sure that both of the, those are satisfied. And then the match will happen. So I can say six match case even positive. Six is both even and positive. So you get true. And the implementation is pretty straightforward. Match is nothing but the wrapper for your function. So all you have to do, will uh, do is uh, create a matcher, which calls both and puts an and between. Another uh, interesting thing about pattern matching in Scala is that uh, even pattern matching blocks themselves are values. 
So I've defined two blocks here, right? And stored them in the variables. And now what I what I can do here is I can compose these two using regular combinators. So this is what I've done. Uh, I took first block and the second block, and I said or else. Or else is the combinator to compose these two partial functions. And as it happens, uh, or else is not a special operator. It's just a just another method. And I can call compose block on drop. And you must have noticed the drop is in the second block. This will be invoked because the resultant partial function that you have is aware of all these cases. You can even ask it whether uh, its domain contains any argument without even uh, invoking it. So these are the kind of things you can do. Uh, and these are pretty useful for things like exception handling, when you want to separate out your handlers, compose them together, and things like that. Uh, now we are seeing a theme here, right? That uh, many of the features that we take for granted or are magic in uh, many functional languages are have some interfaces in uh, Scala which are composed of traits, objects, implicits, and other core primitives, and they are open to you uh, because of which you can use them in ways that uh, other functional languages you do not allow you to. By the way, uh, these uh, pattern matching blocks, I like them so much that I have ported them to closure. So you can check out my GitHub for the implementation. So the next part uh, I have is uh, slightly more advanced. So type classes. Type classes is a very uh, popular feature in Haskell. By the way, uh, how many of you are aware of type classes? OK. So I'll just briefly explain what type classes are. You can roughly think of them as interfaces in your uh, languages except that uh, the implementation resides outside the data type, OK? So let's say there is a data type called uh, integer. It is there. And you want to uh, add a new contract comparable to that data type. So in a, in a language like Java, that will not be possible, because the data type was already defined by someone else. You can't really go and make it implement new interface. In case of uh, type classes, the implementations reside outside. So you can uh, extend the data types even after the fact, even after when they have been already defined. So now, uh, in Scala, uh, we have type classes, but again, not as a special construct. They're implemented using the three constructs that I introduced before, traits, objects, and implicits. Traits and objects, I suppose, uh, we are all familiar with. Uh, implicits is something new to the table. So uh, Scala's type classes uh, started out as poor man's type classes. And then they evolved into something much greater, as uh, I'll try to show with, the, with an example. Before, uh, Moving to type classes, I'll take a moment to uh, talk about implicits. So implicits uh, happen to be the most misunderstood part of Scala. And the reason probably is that uh, the, the word itself. Whenever you say the word implicit, what comes to people's mind is uh, implicit conversions, which as we all know from our JavaScript uh, horror days, is not a good idea, right? Uh, integers becomes a string without your permission and things like that. Uh, this gentleman here captured the confusion uh, very clearly. Sometimes I wonder if the word implicit is part of the problem. It connotes something magical. According to me, better term for implicit would be uh, evidence or witness. So whenever you have an implicit parameter on a function or a class, what it uh, gives you is a compiled time evidence of some fact. Okay, uh, We'll see with examples how. So I'll go to the console. So if you look at, uh, this is difficult. So as you can see, I was able to uh, sort the list, right? So what's the what does the type of this sort uh, function look like? Let's see that. So here's an interest, very interesting signature. There is an implicit parameter of type ordering B. Uh, what it says is that give me an evidence that the type, uh, whatever the type there is, in this case integer, can be ordered. Okay, once it picks that evidence from somewhere, it knows that uh, 
the list the element type is orderable and it will essentially work whereas uh, if you try the same for a data type for which this is not uh, there it will not work uh, let's see an example of that So this guy says no implicit ordering defined for object, correct? <coughs> and this is a uh, pretty cool. And uh, the cooler aspect is that these uh, these evidences, right? They compose. So uh, let's take an example of logic uh, logic programming. So you can make statements like uh, Rama likes mango, okay? And I can say Sita likes whatever Rama likes. So therefore, we can derive a conclusion that uh, Sita likes mango, correct? So here. Uh, Rama likes mango, a statement like this is a fact. Whereas whatever Rama likes, Sita also likes, is a rule, correct? These implicits allow you to do exactly that. Uh, and uh, I'll show you an example how. So in this case, uh, there was a fact somewhere which said integer is orderable, OK? So now I'm going to uh, create a list of people, uh, persons, on which I want to sort by name first. And then on uh, age, age. Essentially, uh, the fact that you or rule that you need is that if A can be sorted and B can be sorted, then A comma B can be sorted, correct? And uh, we have a fact that integer can be sorted, and we have a fact that string could be sorted. So it all works out. Give me any function that goes from A to B, and I will work as long as there is an evidence that B can be sorted. So I'll convert, uh, so I'll give it a function which give, gets me a name and age, a tuple of that, and this will all work out. Right? So uh, as we can imagine, it will be very difficult to add, uh, add an evidence for or implicit parameter for each pair, right? So I need this kind of rule mechanism which enables that. Now I'll get back to the presentation itself. So the implicits are really a very generic mechanism. Uh, I will not go into details of uh, that, but uh, I'll just give you a showcase of what are the kind of things it can do. So we can use implicit to pass regular parameters. Then you can use implicit to pass an evidence that A can be seen. Can I ask, ask you a question? Yes. Uh, no, uh, maybe we can go into the implementation. I don't have an idea open. So. OK, I'll, I'll answer that question. So there will be an implicit val right, for integer, which says that, uh, in fact, let's actually do that. Uh, sorry about that. So here are the bunch of evidences that you can pass. And uh, so there is an evidence that A can be seen as B, or a function from A to B, right? This is the notorious uh, implicit conversion, which is, by the way, not the most common use case for implicits. There are others which, where you can prove A is subtype of B, then, a, then thi other things like that. And then there is this uh, interesting guy called evidence T of A, right? So T here is a type class, the ordering that we saw there, and A is your type parameter, OK? So you can say, find me an evidence that uh, there, is an ev there is a value of type, implicit value of type T A. And this will work out. I'll not go into the others. So uh, there is a talk called, uh, there is a prologue in your Scala, which gives you a very good intuition for these things. So implicit uh, values are like facts, as I mentioned before. And implicit depths are like implicit, uh, sorry, rules. So the question you asked, right, there is an implicit depth somewhere, which says, give me an implicit uh, ordering A and ordering B. And I will give you implicit ordering a comma b, correct? That's why it all works out. So uh, uh, as we have seen with a uh, couple of examples, so uh, in 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 Scala, right? Type classes are regular uh, traits, and uh, the instances that you define are regular objects. The only thing is uh, that is different is the you put an implicit marker on front of it, so that compiler knows that this has to be this has to be looked up when it does the implicit lookup. An advantage of this approach is that uh, if you want to abstract over these things, uh, 
as values you can like uh, with any other regular function any other regular method it does not require any uh, advanced machinery now uh, the idea originally came from haskell however in haskell type classes and instances happen to be second class citizens what do i mean by that <laughs> they have their own special syntax they are not really values and uh, you cannot really abstract over them using uh, regular functions you cannot pass type class instances to a function for example you cannot store them in data structures and stuff like that they are also global and non modular and uh, if you want to abstract over them you will need more extensions like constant kites if you want to do something more advanced than regular use cases you will again need even more extensions like multi parameter type classes functional dependencies and so on but since uh, scala implements them uh, as a first class entity none of this is necessary so in scala these are first class citizens regular objects and classes they are not global they are regular values right you could imagine you could put them in any trait whatever have you you can abstract over them using regular uh, language features and the, the advanced use cases that i mentioned in previous slide which require multiple uh, extensions in haskell are just regular use case in uh, scala so there is this implicit calculus uh, which is being worked on by mr philip wardler this is the guy behind monarchs by the way and uh, they are taking this further so uh, i have covered a uh, covered a few examples uh, and uh, i suppose you must have seen a theme here wherein none of the features mentioned were were uh, native so to speak or primitive to the language they were implemented using the primitives that we talked about before so there were traits there were objects and there were implicit and all of these combined in some interesting ways to uh, give you most of the benefits i would not say all most of the benefits that you get from the equivalent features in other languages and it this doesn't end here actually there are many many more uh, exam such examples so for those of you who you, who attended moit's talk there were signatures and functors right oh uh, who have seen those uh, signatures and functors in the talk okay so the signatures and functors those can be implemented in scala again using the same traits and objects this is a small very small screenshot but it's the exact same example this guy is implementing a queue uh, using regular traits and objects so uh, these are the kind of things by the way we, even we use this uh, module pattern in our code base and it uh, works out pretty well we don't have to have uh, special syntax for functors uh, signatures it all works out with this simple pattern and the advantage of having this is that as i mentioned before everything that was available to classes is available to these guys and abstracting over them is uh, really easy so there are uh, another things i will not go into that in summary uh, scala comes across as a very uh, complex language that's a common perception and which is true from certain perspective however there is a method to this apparent madness it's not all done in uh, just whimsically and unification can give you a simpler uh, mental model to work with so imagine a language where you have all of these concepts okay as separate separate components how uh, heavy that might be that would uh, require more syntax more syntax more specific features right in scala that's not the case somehow the things even the uh, use cases that you have not thought of will work out quite well and one of the examples that i can think of uh, from myself is that so the functional dependencies the term i mentioned before right that's a pretty uh, that requires a an extension in haskell however that's something uh, scala programmers uh, when they define type classes end up doing automatically but they don't know don't know this is a special thing in the so this is again fake aristotle who says the whole is greater and simpler than the sum of its parts now uh, i hope you have not uh, done too much cooled because there will be downsides to everything in uh, computer science everything is a trade off so one man's unification is another man's conflation so by conflation you mean uh, you are confusing two concepts which are really distinct as one and uh, when you uh, do something like that right uh, this is not an easy fit and when you try something like that there will be downsides there will be some friction so there are ideas which do not uh, carry over very well from various uh, par so called paradigms and there will be some mismatch when it shows it's going to hurt real bad uh, other other practical problems that i think are uh, are there uh, like too much rope and you, you can have awkward metaphor mixing so you can have something which you will not be able to tell whether it's an object or type class of what really so uh, if you want to maintain idioms and styles in a large team setting 
that will be a largely a matter of convention. And I, I would say this is true of any programming language, right? Any advanced programming language, to be uh, more clear. So even Lisp, right, you could do whatever you want. So we trust you as programmers. We give you the power, and uh, it's up to you to judiciously use that. So yeah, there is no free lunch. There are always trade-offs. And if you want to hear some really uh, genuine criticism of Scala, I say genuine because there is a lot of criticism of Scala, and uh, most of which is uh, frankly bullshit. If you want to listen to some genuine criticism, watch talks by this guy. Uh, this is Paul Phillips, who worked on Scala compiler for five years, and he hates Scala. So yeah, I'll link you to the talk and uh, do watch if you want to see the other side. Now the oh wait, now the takeaways. So there was this uh, nice quote uh, on Twitter uh, some uh, months ago. Software is overrun with absolutist movements and sorely lacking in nuanced context-aware analysis. This captures my frustration with software industry very well. We are adamant on making uh, these groups for I don't know why. There are there are functional camp, there is an object-oriented camp, and they want to fight. And uh, if you look at the real master set, you would not find them fighting. They will be having lunch together while these guys are fighting. Very well. So please uh, watch it with uh, full attention. Oh, my cursor is gone. Oh, it's not there, right? So, yeah. Exactly, Tordo Ediwar. For those who don't understand Hindi, it means break the wall. This is from a famous Indian advertisement of Ambuja cement, where two brothers want to break the wall between them. So yeah, uh, conclusion, uh, keep an open mind, stay a humble learner, forget your paradigms and embrace ideas. And uh, that's uh, all I had really. Thank you. Uh, links. So I will upload this presentation later. Uh, and in the presenter notes, you will get all the resources, papers and talks that I referenced. Questions? Okay. So small hiring speech. We are hiring. If you want to work with Scala, me and my colleagues, please join. Thank you.